My family has a cabin in British Columbia that was built by my great grandparents. We use it as a vacation spot every summer since that side of my family is huge. We always have to coordinate with everyone to pick who gets which weeks. One summer, about nine years ago, my uncle had a new girlfriend who later became my favorite aunt, Kerry. We decided to all sort of convoy out together, and around 8 p.m. we all pulled up to the cabin. It was starting to get dark, and there was a heavy feeling in the air that evening. I figured we were all just beat from the nine hour drive that day. All of us started pulling the suitcases and coolers out of the trucks and putting them on the front deck. Kerry being the new person in the family wanted to help out to make a good first impression. So she started bringing everything inside for us by herself. She disappeared into the cabin for several minutes and came back out with a strange look on her face. She walked up to Nana and said something about another relative still being there, and that she thought our group was the only one booked that week. My grandpa has a sketchy homeless slash addict sister who frequently squats in the cabin when people aren't there. So of course, she gets irritated and calls out my grandpa. For Christ's sake, Bill, Carrie says Sylvia is here. But immediately, Kerry says that she didn't think it would be Grandpa's sister unless she happened to be about 20-ish years older than him. At this point, my Nana is playing confused and decides to go in to see who it is. I trail her being a nosy kid and she looks upstairs and I take the main floor and I run into my uncle who is using the bathroom. Kerry walks inside and he says he heard her talking to someone a minute ago and asks who it was. Oh, I ran into a woman in that bedroom when I came in. I just said hi to her. And she points to the bedroom that used to belong to my great grandmother before she passed. Still, at this point, none of us had clued in on what had happened until my Nana came back downstairs to tell us no one was here. I started to feel creeped out, and I can see that Carrie and my uncle are as well. We resume our unpacking and Carrie starts to carry her things upstairs, but stops on the stairwell and drops her bags. My uncle asks if she's okay and she can barely get a word out. She points to a picture we have on the stair landing and says, that's her, that's the woman I saw. The picture was of my great grandparents and it had a small plaque at the bottom with their names. Of course, my uncle is a skeptic and immediately says, nice try, but no way. That's my grandma May. She died like six years ago. Kerry looked at him and me and my Nana, and I will never forget the look on her face. It was such an intense look of shock and sadness, a look that made my uncle, Nana and I all believe her. She told us that she swore she came in to bring my Nana's things into the bedroom and saw an old woman standing by the window. She apologized for barging in and that it was nice to meet her. And then the woman smiled before turning back to the window. She even described what she was wearing, a green velvet material sweater with beadwork in the shape of a daisy in the front, my great grandma's favorite sweater. And we all got chills and told everyone else what was happening. My grandpa is a stern, bull-headed man who refuses to believe in anything slightly abnormal. Yet even he seemed creeped out upon hearing that my aunt had apparently just seen his mother. My aunt is far from the only person in our family who has seen or heard something like that in that room. Even I had a similar experience. Late one night, everyone was out having a fire in the backyard, and I ran inside to get marshmallows. You have to pass that bedroom to get to the kitchen from the back door. And as I did, I distinctly heard a conversation happening in the room. As I mentioned before, everyone was still outside. The closer I got to the door, the quieter the talking got, till it faded away. This was after the incident with Kerry, so I just poked my head around and said, Good night, Nana Mae, and found the marshmallows and went back outside. 
The tales I have to tell about that cabin could fill a book. Most of them not nearly as light-hearted or happy as the spirit of our Nana May popping in every now and then. Maybe I'll share more another day. I've had a series of strange events happen in haunted woods. All of this happened this summer when I was working and living in the Chicago area. I don't know much about spirits or paranormal events, so I'll just give you the facts of what happened and you can make your own conclusions. In the first few weeks of my new job, I met this really great guy called Paul. We hit it off immediately. And one day he suggested we go hiking in the woods. I'm from Russia originally, so I was practically raised in the woods and I was really excited about this proposal. As we're hiking, it starts pouring with rain, an amount the likes of which I had never seen. We go deeper and deeper into the forest until there's no more paths and we're practically treading swamp water. All this time, we're just talking about random stuff and getting to know each other while not really paying much attention to the surroundings. There's no one around since we've gone pretty deep in already and it was pouring buckets. Eventually, we stumble on the skeleton of a teepee just the bare wooden structure of it and thought it was pretty cool. So we kept going in that direction. Suddenly we both hear someone crying. It sounded like a baby and it's a forest. So lots of animals can imitate that sound like deer, cubs and the like. The cry sounded distant. So we thought nothing of it and walked forwards. Within seconds, we heard the thing right next to us, which seemed strange since it sounded so far away at first. It was so loud, it could have been a few feet away. And we started looking all around, even looking at the trees and absolutely nothing was there. It was a pretty weird situation. So we kind of speed walk in the other direction. As soon as we stopped for a break, the sound starts up right next to us again, like something was telling us to book it. So we did ran faster than was probably safe in that kind of weather, half looking at Google Maps and half relying on memory. We made it back to the entrance of the woods and both agreed that what happened was pretty weird and decided to look into the history of the place. Immediately websites like most haunted forests in Illinois started popping up. Turns out the place was a site of ancient Native American burial grounds. Not surprised since a lot of tribes used to live in various parts of Illinois. Paul and I went back and I've kind of forgot the incident until one evening after work when he tells me that he can't stop thinking about the cry and wants to go back to see what was there. Naturally, I think it's a stupid idea, especially because it was already dark out. But then Paul's friend Ryan joins him for kicks. And since I'm worried for both of their safety, 20 something fresh out of college dudes can be very dumb. You see, I come along with them, thinking that I can at least keep them out of trouble. So we hop in the car and drive over there. The traffic is insane and my friend takes a wrong turn. So we don't get there until 11 PM. We get out and head into the forest. Now there's no street lights anywhere near us except right at the edge of the road and the flashlights can only do so much. So our visibility is pretty bad. We eventually get to a small wooden bridge that leads us across the river into the actual deep part of the forest. And as soon as we cross, I start feeling uneasy. We weren't supposed to be in the woods that late in the first place. But there was a deeper feeling of guilt, like we were intruding or disturbing something that was there. Brian, who's been leading the way and feeling all confident and cocky, saying that there's nothing out here, 
stops all of a sudden. On the other side of the bridge, the three of us were hit with this feeling of dread and panic. One I've never felt in a forest before. And I've been to lots, both in the day and at night. We all exchange nervous looks and suddenly hear crunching coming towards us from the dark. The feeling at this point gets so intense that Ryan, confidently walking ahead seconds ago, now looks uneasy and says, I think we should go back. We all slowly turn around and start speed walking towards the bridge. No one talks until we get to the other side, and Ryan says, I was just nervous, because it might have been a homeless person and I didn't want to deal with that. Eventually, we get to the road where our car was parked, along the side, and that's when I see a girl, maybe in her early 20s. She looked Native American or a mix of Asian Latino, just walking along the highway. She was wearing very little clothing and looked a little strange. Her walk wasn't a drunken one. She just seemed to be almost vibrating, undulating, but there wasn't a building around for miles. My stepdad is Malaysian and he's told me a bunch of ghost stories about young ghost women on the sides of the roads that kill drivers. But I was willing to risk it because I didn't want to leave the girl alone, ghost or no ghost. So I convinced Paul to slow down a bit when we get to her. And I called out to her from the passenger window, asking if she needed help. The girl slowly turns around with the creepiest, slowest smile spreading across her lips and nodded. I was hit with that same feeling I got back there in the forest and almost regretted slowing down. But whatever, my sense of wanting to help that girl was greater than whatever weird stuff I was feeling. And if I died then, at least I'd have a clean conscience. She gets in the back of the car right behind my seat and next to Ryan, who is a bit of a flirt, and he starts to chat her up, asking where she's from and what she's doing. All this time I'm turned halfway around, keeping an eye on her because I feel like as soon as I turn around and face the road, something bad is gonna happen. She's making eye contact with me the whole time, even when Ryan is talking to her with that very slow, creepy smile. Ryan asks her where she's coming from, and she says, Oh, just around. He asks if she's coming from a bar, and she nods, except of course there are no bars around for anywhere. She says that she was walking, and gives Paul an address, which is 15 minutes away by car. My eyes hurt from making eye contact with her, and she just kept smiling and undulating, and this feeling of dread just kept increasing. So we eventually drop her off at her street, and when I turn back to look a second later, she's gone. I couldn't sleep that night. I kept imagining her creeping up the stairs, her smiling face undulating from the shadows. When I was rather young and in second grade, my family lived in the country out in the middle of nowhere in Mississippi. There were no children for me to play with, and I tended to be a bit lonely, as you might expect. When we were in the process of moving out there, my parents had this double-wide trailer, and there was one incident that took many years to be certain I hadn't imagined. While on one expedition to the plot where my family were going to put the trailer, my mother needed to make a stop to use the restroom. With no gas station for a good 10 miles, Dad pulled the truck down this dirt road looking for a place to halt. There, maybe 200 to 300 yards from the two-lane road, we found what looked to be an abandoned gymnasium from a school. Dad decided to use that as a place for the bathroom, and we headed in. I did not recall much about the building, though one thing always stuck out in my mind. 
near the doors we entered through was this rather massive pile of clothing. I remember after doing his business, my father stood at the front of it looking up at the clothing. He seemed to be thinking of something but never said anything about it. Several weeks later, with the trailer in place, we moved out there and the gym was largely forgotten about by me. However, that didn't stop weird things from happening. Well, not weird in the sense of stuff moving around or anything of the sort. Weird sounds. Within a month or so of living there, I was playing on the front porch where I heard laughter. Now, before I go any further, let me clarify as to where we lived then. The trailer was a good hundred feet back from a dirt road, and across the road was the home of an elderly gentleman, I'll call Oliver. Behind his house was a rather extensive stand of pine trees that reached right between the two-lane highway, probably a distance of 500 to 600 feet total between where I was and the highway. In any case, as I sat on the front porch my father had built, playing with some of my toys, I kept hearing laughter. Not a single child's laugh, but several. It sounded to my ears like five or six kids were playing somewhere off behind where Oliver lived. Not having anyone to play with, I remember wondering where those kids were, and if they would play with me. Walking up to the road, I could tell that these kids seemed to be playing in the woods, as their laugh came and went. After a while, I called out to them that I wanted to play too, and as soon as I said that, the laughter cut off dead. One moment there was laughter and fun, and the next, it was so quiet that you could hear a pin drop. I figured I must have scared the kids off, and went back inside. This happened several times, and eventually I just gave up. I'd hear the kids laughing and playing, but they never seemed to get closer. After a couple of times of this happening, I remember telling my mother, and she got a really odd look on her face before telling me that she didn't want me playing out front any longer. We lived there for another two years or so before we moved, and I largely forgot the experience. It wasn't until many years later when the story came up again in conversation with my parents. That's when I found out some of the story, and personal investigations told me the rest. My mother said that the reason she'd reacted that way was because she'd heard a rumour that the area we'd moved into was haunted. She didn't have all the details, but felt it was tied to the old gym. All she could say, or would say, was something bad had happened, and she was afraid. After my parents passed, I forgot the story again. It always stuck in the back of my head as something weird, but that was it. Eventually, one bored night, I happened to stumble across the website for the church we had been attending. On a lark, I shot an email off to the pastor asking if there had ever been a gym near where I remembered, and I didn't expect to hear back. Two months later, I checked my emails to find that yes, he had actually replied. Here is what he related to me. There had been a gym that once stood near where I described, though it had long since been torn down. The gym had been part of a private school which had stood there from roughly 1900 to 1979 or 80. Early in the spring of that year, a tornado had gone through and demolished most of one wing of the school, and in doing so, killing a number of students. The building had collapsed, burying the students under the rubble, resulting in the death of a number of them. I think between 10 and 15. And after this, it was decided to close the school. As they were demolishing it, they cleaned out clothing from lockers and various places, dumping it in the gym in a tall pile. I remembered seeing that. The gym had been left standing because it was hoped that one of the local churches might use it, but given what happened there, it ended up being abandoned. Q 
Curiously, the property behind Oliver's house had also been part of the school property at one point, being used by the students as a kind of playground area. This did explain why Oliver kept digging up old toys, mostly metal trucks and such, to which he gave me. Looking back, I've come to the conclusion that what I had been hearing was in some way tied to the old school and loss of life. Though I also wonder if in some way it could have been my childhood imagination running wild. Whatever the case, I thought you'd find the story interesting to say the least. My uncle had just gotten married and he and his wife and her daughter had gone to Big Bear as a sort of honeymoon trip. He rented a cabin in a nice area near the lake. They had all settled in and had a nice day at the lake, came inside, had dinner, and after some TV time around eight-ish, his wife and her daughter went to bed. It was a small one-bedroom cabin, so the layout was like one small hallway that led out to the back of the cabin, where the entrance to the bedroom was across, and a ways up was the bathroom. So the bathroom and the bedroom don't look into one another. You would cross the bathroom entrance before reaching the bedroom if you were going down the hall from the living room slash kitchen area. The living room and kitchen were one big room at the front of the cabin. My uncle had stayed up to watch TV and an hour or so passes by and he has to pee. So he goes into the bathroom and doesn't bother closing the door because no one was up there anyway and proceeds to do his business. As he's doing so, he sees his wife pass by the doorway on her way towards the living room slash kitchen area. He finishes up, heads into the hallway to catch up with her and sees her at the end of the hallway. He was about to say something when she kind of half turns towards the kitchen and suddenly flies into the kitchen at breakneck speed, making no noise and disappears. He runs down the hall which is only really a few steps into the dark room, lit only by the TV still on, and no one's there. No lights are on, no one's in the kitchen at this point, and he was pretty unnerved, so he goes back down the hallway and looks into the room to see his wife and daughter 100% asleep and undisturbed in bed. He realised that the woman he saw wore a knee-length white sleeping gown, while his wife was wearing pyjamas. So he has no idea who it was that he saw walk past him in the restroom, or who it was that flew unnaturally into the kitchen. He was scared, but saw no reason to wake up his wife or kid, but he didn't want to go to bed. So as soon as they woke up, they packed up and left before he told them what he had seen. Later on, he called up the owner of the cabin and asked him if anything weird had happened up in the cabin. The guy went, Oh, you saw her. He hadn't told the guy that he had seen a woman at this point, only that he was wondering if anything odd had been reported in the cabin prior. I work in a wildlife rehabilitation centre in the middle of a forest, atop a hill about 20 minutes away from the nearest streetlight. It's a beautiful property during the day, but at night, you can hardly see your hand in front of your face unless the moon is high enough over the trees to shed a little bit of light on the area. I started working here last year, usually being put on the closing shift, but we typically were on the property until the wee hours of the morning, since the sheer number of animals in our care prevented us from going home before everything was complete. The facility itself is deeply haunted. I've known that since a few weeks into my employment. One of the routes for the Trail of Tears actually went right through what is now the property, but more of that later. These are some of the stories that I have collected while working here. One night as we were all wrapping up downstairs and getting ready to shut down for the evening, the doorbell rang. It must have been 10pm by then, and we close admissions by 5 usually, as all of our admissions are by appointment only. But only on occasion, 
we get a walk in. With a sigh, my co-worker goes upstairs to greet the person and take the animal down for a quick examination. After a few minutes, she comes back down empty-handed and looking a bit unsettled. Upon being asked what the problem was, she answered, there was no one at the door. There's no other car in the lot. This happened at least two to three other times. I've always been a little sensitive to the paranormal, but I'm pretty skeptical by nature. I want to first rule out any other possible scenarios before jumping to the conclusion of something otherworldly. So I chalked these situations up to an electrical error. The building took on a whole new energy at night. Rooms of the facility that were well lit and normal during the day felt more ominous at night. I never wanted to be alone inside by myself after 8.30. That's when things got weird. Mostly, it's just the feeling that I'm being watched or thinking I see something out of the corner of my eye. It's all just very unsettling. As one of our interns was leaving one night, she said she heard someone calling her from the parking lot. Psst, over here. There was no one there. One night, my co-worker went outside to finish up animal care in some of the outside enclosures that hadn't been done during the day. And I was left alone inside to finish prepping diets for some of the raccoon babies we had inside. We had a microwave above the counter and I'd long since gotten used to seeing my silhouette in the reflective sheen on the door. I reached up to retrieve the bowl that I would put into the microwave and shut the door once I was done, only to see the reflection of a silhouette behind mine. I whipped around so fast I nearly dropped the bowl. No one was standing behind me, and when I looked back into the reflection, the silhouette wasn't there anymore. As I said previously, the trail of tears ran through the property, and at least two of my co-workers have made separate comments about seeing a woman in buckskin, either walking through the hallway or standing in the laundry room. She always moves out of sight before anyone can try and say something to her. We have a separate little building on the property that's now a storage unit. It wants to house interns that would stay on site overnight, but it's been a long time since it's been used for that purpose. I've always gotten a weird feeling whenever I'm near it. I've never been inside, and I hope I'll never have to. Any time I walk past it, I feel incredibly unsettled, like there's someone standing behind me or watching me. Several months ago, I was informed we no longer have interns living in the building because late one night, a man walked in and stood in the doorway staring at the interns while they were trying to sleep. Since then, we've installed trail cams and security cameras all over the property. There's a million stories I can tell about this place, and maybe one day I will. So far, these are the only true paranormal feeling ones that I have to share. Three years ago, I went on a residential trip to Castleton as part of the NCS. I applied to take part in it after I finished senior school. It was an amazing experience and by far the best month of my life. Me and all of my friends were there and I'd met this boy that I liked at the time. We spent a lot of time getting to know each other and eventually we decided to go off in the forest on the last night in the residential. We go off walking about and decide to sit down at what I can only explain to be a fence step, a step to get from one side of the fence to another. We sat on one step each while facing opposite each other. I was facing the forest and he was facing the plain field behind me. For some reason we got an eerie feeling as we were alone and he started talking about his grandmother's death and had a tear in his eye. 
All of a sudden, I noticed this seven foot figure behind the trees clasping onto the thick and tall tree trunk, whilst peering around and staring at me and this boy. I looked in utter shock, as did he, and we both saw it at the same time. I can only explain that it was a seven foot tall man that was in perfect physical proportion for his size. He appeared see-through, but white and cloudy in the shape of a man, like a shadow, but in like a vape cloud colour. And although he had no features and expressions, we both saw him stare at us. When he realised we had seen him, he began to run to the right of me before compacting himself into a knob and zooming out of the forest. The next day, one of the other girls who believed in all the supernaturalistic things had come up to me and asked if I saw something, to which I replied yes. Only for her to say, yeah, I saw an apparition of a man that was see-through and had white cloud shadow on Monday. He was in front of this forest when I saw him from my window. This was by far the most amazing experience in my life, and I know exactly what I saw. I remember it like it was yesterday. I did try to do some research to see if it was true, but I could not find any evidence of this place being haunted. Still to this day, just thinking about it makes me shiver. I was walking home from school as a young teenager slash preteen along a rural, heavily wooded road and I passed one of two dilapidated hunting cabins visible from the roadside. They hadn't been used since the early 20th century, save as popular locations for kids to explore. I saw a group of three kids who looked slightly older than me, and who were dressed in what struck me as strangely formal fashion. I distinctly remember a red bow tie, and all three were in dress shirts and a dress blouse. Two boys and one girl. I watched them walk into the cabin. The boys appeared to be goading the girl in. She was playful, resisting and giggling, and they didn't seem particularly sinister. But I was curious as I didn't know them, and there weren't a lot of kids in the general vicinity of where I lived. So I went up to the cabin. I couldn't have arrived more than 30 seconds after they did, including a brief, is this creepy of me, kind of pause. When I look inside, the place was empty. It had a single room, no closet space, and no furniture to hide in. There were old bed springs, but the fabric had long rotted away. There was no attic or basement area. I'd seen the space under the cabin before. There was no exit except for a high window which was narrow, and I seriously doubt the three of them could have fit there, let alone in that span of time. I wrote this off at the time, as my mind playing tricks on me. Sometime later, I would come to learn about the three kids who had, decades earlier, lived in the area. Two boys and a girl. They were known to have spent a long time exploring the old cabins, family graveyards, and Indian caves that were dotted in the local woods. One day, the girl vanished after telling a friend that she was going off on one such mini-adventure. Both boys swore up and down that they had not met up with her on that day. Her disappearance was never solved, and I'm 100% certain that I was not aware of this story at the time when I witnessed the Vanishing Teenagers. There is an old legend in Virginia of a road in Yorktown called Crawford Road. There are tons of ghost stories about that road. One being an African-American lady that hung herself off the bridge and can still be seen hanging herself off the bridge if you go under and look behind you. There are other stories of soldiers walking down the road, lights in the distance, and cars stalling when you park under the bridge. There are a lot more stories that you can look up on your own, but this is the story of me and my friend's experiences down that road. 
I was personally not a believer in ghosts, because I never saw one until that night. So to start the day, we were talking about some paranormal experiences. Me and West mentioned that we had never had a paranormal experience before. So West was determined to have one tonight, and wanted to know of a haunted location. I remembered a friend of mine that lived in Yorktown, telling me of the legends of Crawford Road, and I brought it up to the group. We checked the time it would take us to get there, and we thought to kill time until it got dark. All the while, we're reading up different stories online to see what we were getting ourselves into. Needless to say, everyone was pretty excited, but we were not prepared for what would happen. Once night hits, we go down the road, and we don't see anything unusual, as many other cars were also going down the road, and there was a cop sitting at the top of the bridge. So, we decided to go get some food while we waited a bit longer for the road to be less congested and for the cop to leave. An hour later, we go back down the road once we get to the bridge, and there's another group of people on the road, looking to see what they can find. We chat for a bit, and they say that they haven't seen anything. So our group goes up to the top of the bridge to see what we can find. We're all up there, and we don't really see anything besides a strange symbol on the road and your typical graffiti. We see a car coming, and we didn't want to get caught. So, me, West, and Abel go back down, while Natalie and Jay stay up there, and turn their lights off. After less than two minutes, Natalie and Jay run down, freaking the hell out, saying they both saw a tall woman dressed in white walk out of the woods into the bridge. Obviously, like idiots, our group walks up to see. We couldn't see her when we went up there, but as we looked down onto the road to see if we could see anything, all of a sudden we hear an angry scream in the distance. We all book it, and get the hell out of there, and the other group bail as well as soon as they heard the scream. We start to drive away from the bridge, and being determined to see an actual ghost, all of us had our windows down, and were taking constant pictures while driving. Eventually, we hear Jay panicked tell us to drive faster, as he's sticking his head out of the window. Once we get far enough, he says that he saw something on four legs running after the car. This was only the start, and we begin to look at the pictures we had taken, and watch the video West had been taking the whole time that we were down there. In the video, when we heard the scream and start to run, we could clearly hear a gargled cackle that we did not hear at that moment, and the pictures were even worse. Some of them were of nothing, but a lot of Jay's photos had a mysterious glow in them, and another one of our group's pictures were completely white, whilst the rest were fine. In some of the photos, we could even see a strange blue box in both Jay and Abel's pictures, which was made even worse because they were on opposite sides of the car. And the worst one is when Natalie took a picture of the side view mirror and could clearly see a face with two black eyes. We were properly freaked the hell out, but we decided to drive down the road one last time to do the same thing, and take pictures on all sides of the car. While going down it, we didn't see anything of interest, until at the bridge, when Jay said he saw someone in white waving at the car. But the pictures were a completely different story, as one of the pictures that Natalie got was of the four-legged creature sitting on the top of a broken fence post, like it was waiting for us. After that, we decided to get out of there, and finally get home. When we get back, we can clearly see a large handprint 
and a small handprint on the window on Jay's side. We also see a multitude of other handprints on the car, as well as scratch marks, and on the back of the car, the same symbols that were on the top of the bridge. When we got home, I looked into further detail about the stories from others, and found out that the scream was something of a call to the others on the road, which would explain the creature chasing us. But I haven't been able to find a single one about a four-legged creature chasing them. This had to be one of the scariest nights of my life, and we are all planning to visit Crawford Road again, to see what else we might find. For a little background, my family is a bit scattered. I live in Nebraska, while my two half-sisters live with my stepmom, though I'm not sure what she'd be considered now, since her and my father are divorced. I live in Nebraska, while my two half-sisters live with my stepmom in Washington, though I'm not sure what she'd be considered now, since her and my father are divorced and my dad lives with his new wife and my stepsister in a small town outside of Dallas, Texas. As you can imagine, it's a little hard trying to see everyone within a year. However, my sisters were visiting my dad over the summer, and I was able to get a week off in order to go see my family. Since we'd all been down there, and since my sisters and I love creepy stuff, we decided to check out one of the biggest urban legends in Texas, Goatman Bridge. Now it was difficult convincing my dad to let us go. He's super religious and very against haunted things, demons or attempting to contact ghosts. He's also not a fan of how far the alleged haunted bridge was away and didn't necessarily want us to go. So I did what any reasonable 21 year old would do. I told him we were going out to eat after a fun filled day at Six Flags, then drove my little sisters out to the little town of Denton and to the old Alton Bridge where the supposed goat man was. For me and my sisters, getting to the bridge was a little tricky. My GPS wasn't updating fast enough so we wound up missing the turning that we had to do and did a massive loop on the country road in order to get back to the pathway for Old Alton Bridge, since the bridge is closed to vehicles. There was a soccer game going on in the field about a mile or two away from the turnoff for the gravel roads to the bridge. But other than that, everything else was shut down for the night and not many cars traveled the roads. When we finally managed to make the turn down the gravel hill and park, we ran into a group of adults who told us there was no goat man that night, to be safe and to check out the creepy path off to the left. My sister and I thanked the group and ducked under the metal fence as the group left in their pickup truck. It was about 10.30 or so at night and the forest was eerie still though we could hear the cicadas chirping, we all felt some sort of heavy weight pressing down on us, and it felt like we were being watched as we pressed further into the woods. The flashlight of our phones were dull against the thick shrubbery of the forest, and I almost expected something to be lurking in the shadows, though I kept assuring myself I was psyching myself out. We made it to the start of the bridge, and I have to admit, I was pretty spooked. It was so dark you could barely see the end of it, and the feeling of being watched felt stronger. I brushed it off once again, as my own paranoia and me and my sisters continued to walk down the bridge, commenting about how cool and creepy it was, and reading the writing and satanic symbols scrawled onto the bridge. As we were walking and I flashed my light to the end, I could have sworn I saw a black mass standing at the end, but when I looked again, it was gone. I also heard something moving around in the woods back from where we came from, and in the creek down below, 
but neither me or my sisters saw anyone else. However, this is when things started to get a little strange. My sister Cadence was by herself over where I thought I saw the shadow, and she told me she saw what looked like an eye watching her from underneath the bridge. My other sister Kayla felt physically sick and thought she heard a voice, but she couldn't really make it out. I decided it was time to leave the bridge and maybe check out the pathway the group was telling us about. And as we were walking towards the path, both mine and my sister's flashlight went out. I got a little freaked, but told myself it was fine and turned on the phone flashlight while my sister struggled to turn hers on. And as we neared the path, I saw it. Standing by the entrance of the forest, about 20 or so feet away, was a tall, thin, black, shadowy mass. It looked slightly transparent, but was also somehow solid, and looked like it was almost flickering or wavering. It's hard to explain. It looked like it had long, sharp claws, and it looked like it was holding something in its hand, but I couldn't make out what it was. Its eyes were hardly visible, but I felt it watching us. The presence felt evil. Now, I didn't move at first. I thought my mind was playing tricks on me, so I took a step closer to see if I could make it out. But when I did, the thing moved and the slight unease I felt went into complete panic mode. I don't think I've ever screamed so loudly before in my life. I told my sisters to run, and at first they thought I was joking. But when I crept screaming and told them to go back to the car, they realized that I was being serious, and we all ran back to the car that was parked on the gravel road. I took one last look behind my shoulder and saw the shadow running towards us, but then it vanished. I turned my attention back to what was in front of me and slid under the metal bar and fence, unlocked the car and tore out of the makeshift parking lot. I was shaking, crying and could hardly breathe. My body felt like it was on fire. As we approached the main road, we could make out two men dressed in white running to the forest we came from, and I wondered if it was because they heard me screaming. The hour ride home was silent, and my mind was racing trying to figure out what that thing was. I kept trying to find a logical explanation to what I saw, but I was grasping at straws, and I knew it. Part of me wanted to go back and figure out exactly what it was, and the other part of me wanted to stay as far away as possible and just be content with not knowing. Either way, I was creeped out and I genuinely feared for my safety and my sister's safety. I never expected to find anything on that bridge. I thought it was just a creepy urban legend made up by locals and that there was nothing to be afraid of. But that night proved me wrong. And though I doubt what I saw was the goat man, I can't shake the feeling that there is something at Old Alton Bridge that is truly malicious. This is my uncle's story. He lives in West Virginia, one of the more remote states in the eastern United States. While his main house is in town, he also has a small cabin up on Spruce Knob, where he and my aunt would go during the summers. This cabin is very remote, and accessed only by jeep trails, and isn't connected to the electrical grid. So my aunt and uncle decide to take advantage of a three-day weekend sometime in the late 80s, and headed out to the cabin for some fly fishing and relaxation in the woods. When they arrived, my aunt went out to sketch some, while my uncle unpacked and built a fire in the fireplace, as it was already getting dark. As night became full, my uncle noted how unusually quiet the woods were. He'd been camping, canoeing, and backpacking all over the world, 
and he still says that this is the quietest he'd ever heard them. He and my aunt packed everything up and went to bed late. Sometime around midnight, my uncle awoke to a strange thumping and scratching noise coming from outside. He thought it was probably a bear or coyote trying to get at the dog, and he grabbed his 444 Marlin to go deal with it. As he pulled the gun out from its case, the door to the outside swung open, and a large hairy shape that was vaguely humanoid appeared silhouetted in the moonlight. He said he never got quite a good look at it, but the one thing he really remembers is the overpowering smell, a stench of decay and two glowing red-yellow eyes. He quickly emptied the 444, and while he didn't get a kill shot, he did scratch the beast's arm, which caused it to run squealing into the woods. He and my aunt immediately grabbed their things, got in their bronco and hightailed it out of there. Whatever my uncle saw never really bothered them again, and when he returned in the morning with more people and more firepower, he found little evidence of any intrusion, except for a single strange clawed footprint in the front of the cabin, and claw marks on the door. I don't know whether to believe my uncle or not, as he's known for telling tall tales. However, unlike his other stories, he was completely serious when he told this one, and my aunt backed him up. This story has always deeply disturbed me, as I too spend a lot of time in the woods, and I will be making a trip up to their cabin this summer. So perhaps I will see this strange beast too. My husband is from Mississippi, and I'm from California. We met in Los Angeles, and when we first started getting serious about eight years ago, he decided he wanted to bring me home to meet the family. Being a history buff, I asked to see the Civil War battlefield while we were there, because we didn't have anything like that in California. Nothing preserved anyway. So we went on a mini road trip just the two of us, to Vicksburg to visit the battlefield there. A lot of it had been taken back by forest, and there's a road that goes through the woods so you can get to each part of the battlefield. It was a weekday, so we were basically the only people around. As we were driving, we took a turn, and that's when stuff got weird. I noticed that the sounds of the forest were suddenly gone, no sounds of trees in the winds, no birds. It was eerily quiet, like someone had a volume remote and hit mute. Also, if you hadn't picked up on this yet, it was the middle of the day. I didn't know if my husband was experiencing the same thing, and since we were fairly new into our relationship, I didn't want to scare him off with any talks of paranormal stuff. I kept my eyes out on the window, and he slowed the car to a stop without saying anything. All of a sudden over the radio, I start hearing men's voices in my ears. I still wasn't looking over and was sort of frozen. My husband slowly turned down and then off the radio. It was apparent now that he had heard them too. Then he turned off the car and the voices got even louder as if we were standing in the middle of a group of men, and they could see us, but we couldn't see them. I can't remember exactly what they were saying, but we both said afterwards we had the heaviest feeling that they were talking about us, and they seemed as surprised to see us as we were to see them. As if I flipped a switch. I have no idea how long we were sitting there for, but then all of a sudden the whispers were gone. The sounds of nature returned at full volume, with birds chirping, trees, and even some deer crossed in front of the car, as if they sensed the coast was clear. That's when another car pulled up behind us. My husband quickly turned the car back on and we moved on. We were both flabbergasted. We had our first paranormal discussion as a couple. What's odd is both of us had previously in our lives been heavily into the paranormal, him leaning towards the very religious aspect of it. At the time this happened, he had left the church and was a non-believer in anything beyond. I was a huge skeptic, 
and had actually been grieving the loss of my faith in the idea that something else was out there. It was an experience that rocked both of us, and neither of us had any idea of the other's beliefs when it came to this stuff. So what do you all think? Did we hit a sort of time slip, and confuse the hell out of some Civil War soldiers? Or was it just a residual haunting that we happened upon? The church I used to attend to had a program where you could volunteer as a Sunday school teacher. I've always really liked teaching kids ever since I was young and thought I'd be perfect for this position. I applied and got the job. Even though it didn't pay, I was more than happy to speak about young children and explain the messages of the gospel. But religion aside, this is about the spooky stuff that happened. Now, bordering our church is a graveyard and a large forest. I never really went in there before, but a few other of the girls who had different Sunday school classes and I would often chat when the lessons and mass ended. We'd have a great time just conversing in the hall and talking to each other and eating cookies and stuff. One afternoon, since we'd become good friends at this point, did we decide that we wanted to go into the woods just to have a nice chat. It was mostly to talk about boys without anyone overhearing us. And so giggling away, we went into the woods. We'd never been there before, but it looked quite safe and undisturbed. So in we went, despite our feet getting muddy. We didn't go in very far. And as we sat down on a comfortable log and tried making conversation, did Abby, one of the girls in our group, scream. She was facing the other way. We all turned around and saw a dark, transparent shape floating in our direction. It was coming at us with speed. And without a moment to spare, did we all hightail it back to the church. My brother kept laughing at me when I told him this story. He said it was just a garbage bag floating in the wind, but we all knew better. It was transparent, and there was definitely a dark and malicious presence with it. All of us saw it, and next week after Sunday school, when we tried to catch up, did I ask them questions, and they all say that they saw this dark floating entity rushing towards us, and that most of all, it was transparent. Kind of staticky. There one second, not the next, and then back again. It's so hard to explain correctly. As you can imagine, we never returned to those woods, and we never told anyone else, other than me telling my brother, about this experience, for fear of sounding ridiculous. This particular event happened to me when I was around 10 or 11. I had been visiting my grandpa's cabin in Big Bear Lake several times a year ever since I was a child. This isn't the first paranormal event I've experienced there, but it is definitely the most memorable. A little backstory. My grandma's cabin sits at the end of a cul-de-sac, right at the end of a vast, mostly unpopulated, aside from a few other cabins, stretch of forest. No matter what I do or how I'm feeling, I always have a very strong sensation that I'm being watched when I'm in many of the rooms of the cabin alone, day or night. I've seen shadow creatures many times in this cabin. I've heard strange knocking, whispering, and just generally feel like there's something else there with us. My grandma has told me of similar experiences, and has warned me before that if I ever get a strange feeling when I'm walking into the forest, to go home immediately. But she never elaborated. Anyway, me and my dad and my uncle were walking on a trail that we've been on hundreds of times before, when we reach the first peak of a hill, 
that we usually like to stop and look out at the view from. My dad and uncle wanted to keep hiking for a bit, but I decided to go back to the cabin on my own, as it was only five to ten minutes away. I head down the usual path that I go on, and I'm not thinking too much about it when I realise that I have no idea where I am. Everything looked the same as usual, but something was wrong. The normal path was different in a way that I can't explain. It seemed to be ten times as long as usual, and everything was silent, and there was absolutely no wildlife around me, not even a squirrel. I kept having all of these morbid thoughts coming into my head, about how I was lost forever, or how some sort of creature was going to swoop in on me. Every ten minutes or so, I'd end up a part of the trail that I definitely recognised, only to be in a completely alien area moments later. The path kept winding and winding downhill, and the sun was setting pretty rapidly. I had to have been walking in the direction of the cabin for more than an hour, because I remember I was checking my watch and panicking. At this point I just accepted that I was lost, I finally made it down to the street, and was relieved to be able to orient myself. But I was only one street away from the cabin, although I should have been much further. I was expecting my father and uncle to be home by now, and for my parents to be worried about me being gone so long. But instead my mother asked me why I came back so soon. I asked how long they'd been out there for, and my mother said, that we'd only walked about 15 minutes longer from where I'd left them. I don't know if I'm reading into this too much, and if I was just a kid with different perceptions, but something felt very off about the whole ordeal. January 12th, 2019. It's 8pm, and I'm gonna be honest, I chose to go out on this particular night because my town was having a little ghost tour at the haunted hospital. I was lonely, and wanted to at least see the others having fun. It was 8pm when I left the house, and planned to be back within an hour. I was having a routine of circling my town in the evening, because I just liked patrolling, and there's always something creepy after nightfall. I made my visit to the haunted hospital, and once I got there I saw flashlights inside the windows and heard laughter. That's nice, I thought. Seeing others have fun made me smile, and got rid of some of the loneliest feelings I was having. This was the halfway point of my walk, and I started my second half heading home. There were some woods on the opposite side of town now but nothing impressive until I got to the last quarter of my walk. Now I was passing the baseball fields on my left, with large wheat fields on my right. This wheat field used to be a large extension of the woods, but was cleared out for growing wheat. I continued again, and crossed the small bridge that went over a creek, and passed another section of woods. I was now heading towards an old metal building, that has recently been turned into a place for making gates and fences. It was around 9pm now. This building had two small white houses inside it, and a stretch of dirt road wrapping around the back side of it before returning to a normal asphalt road. Now at night, this place seems pretty scary. But this was one of my favourite places to hang out at night, and is a normal path I take my walks through. As I was coming up to the dirt road, I saw a very tall, 8 to 10 foot pale figure, with lanky arms, almost dragging the ground, about 40 feet ahead of me, briskly walk from the white house to the woods. I stopped walking. What was that? I thought. Its size confused me, so much that I had forgotten my previous encounter with a smaller version of it. After a few minutes of standing there, I convinced myself to continue walking forwards. I mean, I was an adventurous person, 
and there's no way I was just going to turn around and go home when I saw something so odd and out of place. Not even 15 seconds into walking forwards, this sudden heavy sense of dread overcame me, like a giant weight crashing down on my shoulders. My instincts were telling me something was really wrong. I turned my iPhone light on and shined it at the woods. Nothing. I kept walking while keeping my head on a swivel, looking in all directions to keep my surroundings in check. About the fifth or sixth time, I looked at the woods, and I saw it. A huge, bleached, white, humanoid figure, crouched on all fours. It was easily still five to six feet tall, even though it was bent over. Its black eyes paralyzed me. It had a big, round, bald head, and an extremely emaciated body, void of all hair, with very long, almost dislocated-looking arms and legs. Its legs were like a flamingo bird's at the knee, as it bent backwards instead of forwards. I took all of this in in a matter of seconds. Suddenly, it reminded me of a praying mantis when it swayed back and forth while staring at me, if deciding whether to attack me or not. This broke me out of my trance as I ran as fast as I could. I didn't look back until I had run a block. Out of breath and scared as hell, I finally took a glance back. I didn't see anything in sight. I didn't hear it chase me either. Maybe it was just stalking those people in those two little white houses and waiting for me to go away. Maybe it didn't want anything to do with me. But that wasn't the end. I got home, took a shower, and turned on the lights before I hopped into bed, when suddenly there was something tapping at my window. Three taps and nothing else. I laid in my bed that night, wondering whether it had followed me home or not. A string of bad luck ensued afterwards the following weeks. I was constantly burning stuff on the stove that was relatively easy to make, and I was an excellent cook. My dog started going nuts at night, growling and barking in the living room and at the front door, which she had never done before. And finally, I got deathly sick for three weeks straight, with no sure sign of what I had gotten. 103 fever, vomiting with blood, diarrhea with blood, sneezing, coughing, sore throats, migraines, nerve spasms, a stuffy and dry nose, severe stomach aches, and aches everywhere, especially in my bones. I've had smaller strings of bad luck before, after hearing its mimicking cry, trying to lure me into the woods. But it has never been this extreme. And now, I don't go into the woods anymore. I spent a number of years performing on the Renaissance Fair circuit. I've traveled across the country, direct troops, performed as a swordsman, and breathed fire. Most times, I've lived in a tent in a small tent city on the fair site. Sometimes, if I was lucky, there would be some place I would crash, like a booth or even inside a stage. I was at the Ohio Renaissance Fair, and I managed to get the key to the Gloriana stage door. It was perfect. A back door padlocked from the outside, but the stage door and windows locked from the inside. I'd just leave a window unlocked so that I could come and go if someone knocked on the window. I could still get in. So the place was nice and secure at night, and that was a real plus. Even better was that it was a two-story structure, and there was even a hammock upstairs. Since I performed on the stage during the day, my moving a few things into the backstage area wasn't viewed askance by my fellow performers. I had my sleeping bag, a blanket, and my US mail bag that I carried my clothes in, 
and which doubled as a pillow. I figured I was good to go for the entire season. I spent a good portion of the evenings up top of the stage, smoking cigarettes and looking out over the fair site. The view behind the stage was just overgrown with trees and thick bushes. It came up to 8 to 10 inches from the stage door, so it was a bit claustrophobic back there. But looking out over the stage was really nice at night. I spent quite a few nights up there enjoying the view, smoking and just being at peace. Until the night of the creepy. It was a clear night, and I'd been drinking with the jousters before making my way back to the Gloriana. As I was walking behind the stage, I heard something rustling in the brush behind me. It unnerved me quite a bit, so I hurriedly moved around to the front of the stage, opened up the window, crawled in, and locked things up tight. With my flashlight, I checked things out to make sure nothing had been disturbed, but everything looked like I had left it, or at least hadn't been disturbed enough for me to notice. Locked in and secure, I climbed up the ladder and out onto the stage's upper balcony. There wasn't much of a moon that night, and so it was kind of dark. It was a pretty chilly autumn night, so I wasn't planning on staying out too long, but I enjoyed looking out over my kingdom, looking at the lights and listening to the distant laughter from other Renfolk. The only other sound was the common night sounds, crickets, and other things that buzzed and whirred in the dark. I was on my second smoke. A Clove Sambonera 234. These things can be smoked for about 30 minutes or so. And so I'd savor one of these things over a few nights. I had just taken my second or third drag when everything in the woods behind me went quiet. Even buzzed, like I was, I noticed it. Now here is the point where I tell you my first name is Bob. Growing up, I was called Bobby, and I grew to adulthood, and dropped the childish second syllable, and really came to hate it. From back in the undergrowth somewhere, I heard something, and I first thought it was a bullfrog. It was the deep croaking sound coming from fairly close to the stage's small backyard. I smoked a bit longer, but something was really nagging at the back of my mind, and I was getting tense. So I snuffed the clove out and turned to look over the back. The rest of the night sounds were still silent, only the croaking and an occasional rustling in the bushes. I stood there, listening for a bit longer, before I realised that I wasn't hearing a bullfrog at all. I was hearing a human voice. If you ever made that croaking frog sound as a kid, where you would rasp out the word, Ribbit, while slowly inhaling, so it sort of breaks and pops. That's what I was hearing. Worse still, was that the voice was croaking, Bobby. Well, I was sober as a judge in a matter of seconds. I ducked inside and grabbed my flashlight, one of those really heavy mag lights that can double as a billy club, at least if you don't care about it working as a flashlight after, and started shining it around the back. I couldn't see anyone out there, but while I was looking for the source of the voice, a second voice joined in, and then a third. Who's there? I shouted. Not exactly original, but it was pretty germane to my thoughts at the moment. Nothing. Just three voices croaking out my name. I got that cold, creeped out feeling up and down my spine, and ducked inside and went upstairs. Now, we Rennies generally have a knife of some sort, and mine was a simple dagger with a five inch blade. It was cheap pot metal, and didn't really keep an edge, but it was good enough to eat with during the fair day. But you also sure wouldn't want to be stabbed with it. That said, Having a knife and a flashlight didn't fill me with a whole lot of confidence, and I sure as hell didn't plan on running out into the back to see who was there. 
Then the scratching started. While the croaking voices continued calling my name, I heard the sound of fingernails dragging up and down the backstage door. Sure, it was padlocked, but it wasn't like I was the only person with a key either. That was enough for me. I slowly slid back the latch on one of the stage windows and quietly swung it open. I crept out onto the stage, still hearing the croaking and scratching behind me. I'm not proud of it, but I ran like hell. I jogged across the fair site and back to the jouster world, a loft above one of the site barns. Come morning, I went back to the stage and found all of the windows open, and the back door was unlocked and hanging open as well. Someone had gone through all my stuff and thrown it all over the backstage area, inside and out. I stayed with the jousters for the next two weeks before going on the road and heading down to the Texas Renaissance Fair. To this day, I have no idea who or what was out there, and so in my mind, it will always just be the creepy. About 10 years ago, a friend of mine and I were browsing the interwebs in the living room of a house my father built here on the coast of North Carolina. This setup is a shotgun house, with a lot of the open space on one end, and the living room occupies the same area as the dining slash kitchen. While my friend is hogging the computer, messing around with my mum's window XP settings more than likely. Nothing was particularly out of place and I was feeling bored. I looked at the entryway to the hall slash kitchen, then suddenly and soundlessly, a seven foot tall person walks into view. I'm fixated on it, as there hadn't been anything I had ever seen quite like it. There was a sense of masculinity to its shape, but overall its features were blurred by a shadowy kind of semi-static. I hadn't heard anyone come in, and it was dark anyway, so I thought maybe my eyes weren't focused, and that this was someone who had broken in. It turned its face to me. I shifted in my chair, and could do little else before it did the strangest thing. I felt like it focused on me in that moment, and did this kind of single or half jumping jack with all its limbs spread out. My visual perception of it inverted, and the area it occupied became 100% see-through, and I could see my kitchen through it. But everything else became an opaque, staticky rainbow of colours emitting from its form. I felt a surge of adrenaline through my system, and all my hairs stood on end as the image faded from my vision. I was immobilised, with my attempting to comprehend what had happened in less than 10 seconds. I was stuck with my first rationalization intruder i ran into the kitchen and grabbed a long thick blade running through the house checking every closet corner and behind every door while my puzzled friend watched i asked if he had seen anything recanting my brief experience he gave me a funny look and we went back to the computer after i finished my sweep i was on edge but nothing else happened I have long since looked up information on what it could have been, and about the history of our property. As far as I can tell, most of our place had been used as trash burning spots for a cabin that had long since been torn down, and other houses built over it. The best I can figure? If it wasn't just my imagination, it's likely something like a shadow person. But then again, I don't know. What do you guys think? I live in Illinois. The first event happened in late August of 2016, while we were running late one night. We both ran cross country and track in high school, and still do so to this day. My friend worked a job that wouldn't get out sometimes until 10 or 11 at night, so we would typically go running very late. This had been happening for a few years at this point, so we knew our paths very well. On the local running path, 
down 2.5 blocks into the woods that butts up against a large creek. At some points on the path in the woods, you can see houses and a park, but other times it starts to get a bit more secluded. And we aren't talking like the wilderness here though. There is wildlife in the area, mostly raccoons and skunks and random beavers and the occasional deer. Over the years, we have seen more and more coyotes around the streets, but never in the woods. Given to our location, there isn't a local bear or wolf population, and this is a critical detail to the story. We need to go running one night at around 11.15. I'm not entirely sure of the exact time, but it was fairly late, and the thunderstorms were on the way according to the weather app. For this reason, both of us left our phones in the car. The one time we have, and we've regretted it ever since, and decided to run pretty fast to make it back before the storm. In the woods, it is mostly a wood chip trail until you get to 200 meters from our turnaround spot, a water pumping station, as the town has had flood problems recently where it turns to asphalt. We run to the turnaround spot and start running back, as this was about a quarter of a mile from the wood chips to turn around and back. I would estimate it took around two to three minutes, given a slight stop at our turnaround. On our way back, we noticed what can only be described to this day as an upside down trash can with a fuzzy blurred outline in the middle of the path, right before its transition into wood chips. If I had to guess, I would say it were around three to four feet tall, perhaps on the shorter side. And I again need to stress that this was only two to three minutes after we had our first run by and come back to that exact spot. This thing had appeared there in that short period. We stopped running as this was rather peculiar and not there when we ran by the first time, but we continued walking closer. We thought maybe someone moved something in front of us as a prank, as the only people that frequented the woods other than us at the time were teenagers smoking or drinking, but they are loud and can be heard from very far away. This thing was dead silent and we had continued to get closer until we were around 50-ish feet away, and it started to move. When I say move, it was standing still, but as if it was swaying part of its body completely left, and then completely right. We had seen a red glare on either side when it turned its head, like the lit end of a cigarette when someone inhales. Not a very bright glow, but enough to be seen in the pitch black, as there are no lights in the area. Talking between us, we begin to become very uneased, as this was unlike any person slash animal behavior we had ever seen. This thing made no sound, and we were worried it was some dangerous animal. So we started backing up slowly and made a run for it. It did not follow us, but stayed in place moving in the same manner. We ran as fast as we could back to my car and drove over arriving approximately 25 to 30 minutes later as the storm had started to come in. Looking around, we found no trace of it whatsoever. No broken branches in the woods, no footprints, nothing that would lead you to believe a large creature in the woods visited us. Neither of us could explain it. And after failing to find an observation, we tucked it away. Fast forward to the end of December of that year. We were on another run, one of our first at night since the incident. And when we got to the pumping station, we had found a disturbing sight. We discovered what appeared to be a dead deer leg lodged in the chain link fence, pretty much completely picked clean with the exception of some skin and hair at the hooves at the bottom. The whole thing was pretty intact from thigh to hoof. 
shortly after. I decided to bring a different friend to these woods who had the ability to see spirits, to see if he could discover anything. As we walked by the spot, we saw the trash can. He was startled and focused towards the woods. I asked him what he saw, and without me telling him any other information prior to our arrival, besides having some sort of experience here, he described it as a cloaked figure around the same height as what I saw, with beady red eyes staring at us. He said once it noticed that he could see it, it ran quickly into the woods. In the weeks afterwards, my running friend was back out on the trail, only to discover other bones that we believed to be missing parts to the dead deer. He first discovered a spinal column with rib ends just laying in the grass next to the pavement and woods. He carefully moved it to be with the other deer leg to keep track of them all in one place. Three days later, in the same exact spot, he discovered what appeared to be a neck vertebrae, and then a few days after, in the exact same spot, another bone, one which we do not know which part of the body it came from. At first, we were thinking wild animals when we experienced this creature, but these other occurrences led us to believe something paranormal was afoot in these woods. Does anyone have any explanation for what may be happening here? I can't find answers, and I am desperate for any information whatsoever. I lived in a small city in central Michigan. There is a city park with a forest directly behind my house. For being at the edge of a city, it's a decently large forest. You could say the forest is split by a very thin clearing that cuts it into two. A small part that has walking paths, and then a much bigger part with not very many paths. One summer evening three years ago, out of boredom, six friends and I decided to go out to the bigger part and play hide and seek. Yes, I know, 15 to 18 year olds playing hide and seek but whatever. I was the seeker, and quickly found my friends, Emily, Alice, and Brody. But the other three went pretty deep into the woods. We decided to split off to look for them. Emily and I went one way, while Alice and Brody went another. Emily and I eventually split off ourselves, and I ran into Alice and Brody. We figured out everyone else was lost in the woods, and decided to stay where we were. The whole thing lasted about two and a half hours. During that time, we stayed put and waited for everyone to find their way towards us. This is when the weird stuff started happening. Emily had called Alice several times and told us weird things were happening to her, but she wasn't able to say what due to a poor connection. A little while later, while it was pretty dark out, we saw a white light about 50 yards away from Alice Brody and I in the trees. We called out thinking it was a phone light, and that it was our friends, but we got no response, and for several minutes it just bobbed up and down in the trees, eventually vanishing. We figured that it couldn't have been another person, because we didn't hear any footsteps or leaves rustling and no one could have made it through the dark woods without a light. Immediately after, Brody swears he saw a face right next to him, staring at him, and disappear. By this point, we're freaked out. Later, I went back out to the clearing by myself, because we thought Emily was there, and she wasn't. I saw four or five small red orbs of light circling around the bush. They were not fireflies or lights from a deer cam, as I checked several times. I met up with Alice and Brody and eventually Emily, and everyone else found us and we left the forest. While Emily was lost, she had her own experiences. At one point, she heard very loud footsteps all around her, even though there were no animals. 
She also saw what looked exactly like one of our other friends, Max, on the trail ahead of her, yet he wasn't anywhere near her the whole time. She also heard what clearly sounded like a boy and a girl whispering behind her, yet no one was there. Over the past few years, I've had other experiences out in these woods. One time when it was pitch black out, my friend and I saw six very large orbs of red light fly around us very fast, then disappear. I've seen other large yellow lights flare up and then go away, then flare up again like a lighter, except no one was there. They were way too big to be fireflies. I also heard a human-like moan right next to me. I booked it back home after hearing that, and another time I heard the same heavy footsteps that Emily heard all around me, but not a soul was there. I've definitely experienced some things out there, and I'm not sure if I want to go back. So I figured I'd share my experience living in a 200 year old cabin. All these things happened over the span of the three years that I lived there, in the beginning of 2012. A childhood friend of mine from years back asked me if I would be her roommate. I needed out of my parents' house, and she needed a roommate, so it seemed like a good situation. Now, for the house. Nestled in a suburban area was this cabin. The cabin dates back to sometime in the 1700s. The road the cabin is off of bears the same name as the original family of the house. They owned a large portion of the land that is now one of the largest cities in the US. Search American Colonial Cabin, and you'll see a swath of images that look like it. We originally think it used to be slave quarters, as this is tobacco country, and then we later found out it was a stable house. The stable house theory checks out, as our dog dug up a horseshoe once. I still have that horseshoe. Anyway, the night we moved in, I knew the place was eerie. No doors to the upstairs, which was my room and no doors to the downstairs bedroom. Her bedroom was an addition that someone added in the 80s. The previous owners also added a much needed kitchen and bathroom, as the original layout did not have either. Now that you've got a decent imagery of what I was working with, I'll start with why I'm sharing this. So when moving in, I immediately felt a feeling of being watched. The house always felt dark, cold and moist, much like a cellar. It started with scratching. Every night I would be in bed, and I would wake up to this scratching directly underneath my bed by my head. At first I thought it was mice, but when I listened to it long enough I realised that the scratching was just a long draw, like a foot-long pull, then repeated. I just recovered my head, muffled my ears and closed my eyes. I was a 23 year old man by the way, and I felt like I was cowering, but I was not able to tussle with wood scratching spirits. Alright, so one night I heard something. Normally, I would have been asleep at this time, but I was up late and heard it. It started on the ceiling on the far side of my room. Then it went down the wall, then scratched its way to directly underneath me. After a while, the scratching went across the room, and back to the wall, and then was gone. Here's why it's not mice. My walls were solid wood, as the inside log were the same as the outside. The floor had no space between the ceiling below and the floor above. Like I said, it was an old cabin. I got scared and began sleeping downstairs. My roommate, now wife, asked what was up, and I told her. She said the same stuff was going on when she was home alone. This was in the first week. Here's the creepy part. So when we moved in, I had to unscrew all the screws that the previous renters had to put into the windows. 
I had to unscrew one of the exterior doors that he had screwed shut, and we had to clean out the weird rabbit food from the oven. We had to write, doesn't live here on hundreds of mail order catalogues the previous renter received. We always joke that the guy was a shut-in Satanist, but I don't think that we were far off. We both started sleeping downstairs in the living room, and felt comfortable in numbers. The eerie feeling was easier to deal with if someone was with you. Until one night. I had a dream that a dark force was approaching me. It was in third person, as if I were watching myself sleep. The entity started looming over my head, and all the while I felt a pressure building in my head, and a high pitch ringing in my ears. It got so intense that I sprung up from my sleep and looked around the room. About a second later, the TV shut off. Just cut off. We'd been having problems with the TV randomly turning on and off, but this time was too far coincidental to be brushed off like everything else. Also, I knew I went to bed with the TV turned off. I cut it off. So why was it on in the first place? We started sleeping in her room after that night. She told me nothing really happened in her room. Maybe because it was an addition. I don't know. Well, our ghosts played matchmaker, and now we're trying for a kid. Married for five years. Once I was upstairs reading, and I was falling asleep, and my windows started opening and shutting. I was already at my wit's end with the spirit. So the next day, I set up the same situation. Same thing. Funny. Never does it when I'm not there. I ended up yelling to leave us alone, and that I was tired of it. And holy smokes, it kind of worked. For a while, anyway. Then when I was home alone, the clock started going off as soon as my wife would leave. The drawers would open, and they'd be banging on the front door. Then, over time, it just stopped. Slowed down, ultimately, to nothing. I guess as I matured there, it stopped messing with me. Today, my in-laws live there. They were the landlords, and the home is cute, homely, and warm. I spend time there alone and no longer feel any malice. It's a weird experience, and I would do it all over again if I had to. Our third roommate wasn't your typical, I'll get him at night, kind of entity. It didn't matter what time of day it was and who you were. When my windows were open and shutting the first day, it was night, but the second time it happened, it was in the middle of the day. The first ever experience we had was pounding on the door at night. But later, when my alarm clock was going off, it was 9am on a Saturday. You know, the average time you set your alarm and then pack it into a box in the attic kind of time. If me and my friends were hanging out in the kitchen for a beer, the entity would show itself. Drawers containing silverware and knives would randomly start opening and trash can top would start rocking at 2pm in the afternoon. I'm not sure why the entity just went away, but it did. In some ways, I don't think the house was haunted at all. Sometimes I think we had strong enough negative energy to bring something in. We drank a lot, pills weren't hard to come by, and neither had any idea where to move forward in life. It was almost if your inner voice of hate manifested into a physical form. As we got healthy, got direction and moved forward, the entity slowly subsided. The cabin is still in my family. My mother-in-law refuses to let it go. And I went from being a 20-something-year-old brat to cleaning the gutters and scheduling specialist repairs for the old house. I love that cabin and where it put me. When my father-in-law passed away, I spent a few hours alone in that cabin hoping for a familiar knock, but I got nothing. When I go there now, there's no sense of doom, only warm welcoming, safety, and comfort. It was as if the entity wasn't trying to haunt us forever, only to be a spiritual nanny, so to speak. And when my wife and I matured, it parted ways. But my story isn't over yet. 
My mother-in-law has vowed to never let go of the cabin and its will to my wife and her siblings. The ghost always messed with me more than my wife. I guess I had an open port that it could just slip into easier. But we both had experienced things. I've always been more attuned to the paranormal than her. My mother swears she's seen a ghost. You know, the physical embodiment of a person type. My mother's side has always been sensitive. It's not like we ever spoke about it much over the years, but stories did come up. Mostly good stories. I guess I come from a batch of sensitive folk. Don't get me started on the glass breaking. I haven't figured out that one. And I have a couple more unrelated cabbing stories too. But maybe those will be for another day. There's a valley in the northern part of Norway, with some quite unexplainable sightings and encounters. Some Norwegians might know the valley that I'm talking about, as some Finnish and Swedish hikers were taken by an avalanche in this area a few weeks ago, and it was all over the news. However, this valley is not only home to countless casualties by avalanches, but also, as I said, unexplainable sightings. Several people, including my uncle and aunt, have reported seeing strange and scary things while either being in the forest or the single dirt road that goes through the valley. Here are some true stories about people who've experienced the unexplainable. Number one, the hunter. There's a moose hunter living in the closest village to the valley, who's apparently experienced some quite chilling stuff. So chilling, in fact, that he has never told anyone about what he's seen. There are two encounters that stick out. As I said, this man is a moose hunter, which is a quite popular thing in Norway, with organized hunter teams and a yearly period between October and December when these hunters are allowed to hunt. Norway has one of the highest moose concentrations in the world, so it's not surprising how many hunt for them. However, what this hunter saw was probably not a moose. You see, around a decade ago, he was on post in one of the forests of the valley, waiting for moose. Then suddenly he saw something that scared him to death. He had his gun ready, but apparently it was so scary he didn't dare shoot it. As I said, he's never really told anyone what he's seen. The only thing he did was leave every single one of his belongings, like his provisions, gun, and backpack, and ran straight out of the valley to civilization. Scary, right? Or is it a lie? We don't know. But this next story will surely convince you it's not. The same hunter, for some reason, chose to camp in that valley sometime later. I don't know for sure what happened outside his tent while he was sleeping, because he never tells what he experienced, but something in that valley made his leave all his belongings again and run straight out the valley. However, this time he didn't dare go back for his tent and someone else had to go fetch them for him. Clearly, something very chilling must have gone down in that valley for his seasoned hunter to never return. The next incident is the car that never gets closer. This has happened to several people, but I'm going to tell it from my aunt and uncle's point of view, as they have experienced it as well. So there's a dirt road going through the valley. My uncle and aunt drove their car on this road one night. Now, this valley is a pretty desolate place. By Norwegian standards, it's just one hour from the largest city in northern Norway. So they didn't expect to see any other drivers on that stretch especially because the road was in bad condition. But as you probably would imagine by now, they saw the headlights of a car in the distance. My uncle and aunt didn't care much for it and continued driving, but making space for the other car so when it gets close, it could drive past them. But the car didn't seem to get any closer. The headlights were still visible and it wasn't driving away from them either. So my uncle and aunt started to wonder what it could be. They kept on driving for several minutes, thinking it was a car that had broken down 
and the people needed help getting home. Or maybe it was the ghost car that other people had encountered on the road, known as the car that never gets any closer. And they never got any closer to the car. Now keep in mind, they saw the headlights, not the rear lights. Eventually the lights disappear and they never saw the car again. The third story is the ghost by the river. A friend of my aunt had experienced some pretty scary stuff and seems to attract paranormal entities. One encounter was close to this valley. She was walking by a narrow road with her sister approaching a small bridge. When she got close, she could feel a force pushing her. And when she stepped on the bridge, she got pushed hard and almost fell over into the river below. I don't remember the rest of the story, but I'm pretty sure she was quite frightened after the incident. Point being, this valley and surrounding area is likely very haunted with things that would rather not be disturbed. For the longest time, woods have been growing behind my house. We live in a very rural part of the country, and I've always been what other kids describe as a frady cat. I never liked going into the woods, and I haven't done so in many years due to something that scared the life out of me. When I was about 11 years old, I decided that because I was bored, I would go out and explore the woods. Now in the past, as the property we lived on bordered the woods, I might go a few trees in and leave it at that, but never explored the depths, never ventured to see how deep it went. But today was different. Overcome with boredom and in the heat, I thought I might seek refuge in the cool atmosphere behind the house, in the trees. I got my dog and we started walking into the woods. My parents were at work, so it was just us two. And I was pretty sure that we'd be okay. Like I said, we're pretty rural, out in the middle of nowhere. I don't know how big these woods are, but I know that there's not an end to them for a while. We walk further and further in, until we find a small but quaint clearing. My dog is making weird sounds, sniffing, growling slightly at the ground, and I am just assuming he's found a small animal and is trying to get to it. I ignore him and look around the area. And that's when I noticed something peculiar. Carved into a tree is a strange symbol. I look around. Some other trees nearby have similar symbols carved into them. The first thing I think, that's hard to do. I have no idea what the symbols mean. The first thing that came to mind was that they looked like car make logos, but still, I was quite young. I grab my dog, pull her lead, and start walking her further through the clearing to the other side to see what was there. Just as we're approaching the end of the clearing and going further into the woods, do I hear something behind me? We turn around and there's nothing there. But as I'm looking backwards facing the other way, does my dog go ballistic? She starts growling furiously, snarling as if there's something there, something invisible. And I can see fear in her eyes. She's pulling me on the lead, dashing to get home. She's pulling me so strongly and running so quickly that I let go of her lead. And she runs, terrified all the way back. I look around me in fear, gasping for breath in these few moments unsure of what to do. And then I hear something. It sounds like my name being whispered behind my back. Bradley. I sprint. I don't even look back, 
but I'm 100% sure that no one was there with me. Whatever the case, I made it home and didn't dare look out my window into the woods for a week. When I finally had enough courage to look, I saw nothing. I've never been back, not even to the border of those woods since. I'm too afraid of what I might see if I return. This was back in 2014, but I still remember it like it were yesterday. My grandparents had this cabin that was way up in the mountains. After my grandpa died, my grandma pretty much lived up there since she liked it. I had just finished my second year of college, and my parents and I decided to visit since it had been a while. Now, this was the first time I had stayed there overnight, since we would usually stay at their regular house when we visited. I remember my uncle claimed he saw a ghost when he stayed up there, but I didn't think anything of it, because he usually exaggerates and makes things up. I was the only one still awake at around two in the morning, and I heard what sounded like someone walking around outside. There was gravel all around the cabin, so you could hear footsteps. I initially thought it was an animal, but I decided to look out the window to be safe. I was afraid a person might be out there, because she did have some shady neighbours. I'm looking, and saw no one despite hearing something out there. I turned the outside lights on to see better, and again, saw nothing. The footsteps sounded like they stopped right outside the front door. I looked through the peephole on the door and didn't see anything. There were no footprints around either, which was weird because it had rained earlier and everything was very muddy around the cabin. If something had been waiting around the corner, they wouldn't have had to go through the mud before getting to the gravel. So that's why I figured there would be footprints. Now here's where it gets even creepier. I go into the kitchen to grab a drink, thinking that it must have been an animal when I hear this deep voice. Now it was really low, and I couldn't understand what it was saying. It freaked me out, because I know my dad's voice isn't that low, and neither is my mum or grandma's. I call out, what? And the voice stopped. I peek into my grandma's room, because she sometimes listened to the radio at night, but it was off. The TV wasn't on either. I looked all over and find nothing. Needless to say, I didn't sleep that night. I still have no clue what I experienced, but I'm now starting to believe my uncle's ghost story. The footsteps creeped me out more than the voice, because it was very slow and sounded like someone was taking their time walking to the door. I also felt like I was being watched too. I didn't like staying there after that night. I sometimes wonder if the ghost of my great-grandfather who built the cabin still resides there. He had a deep voice from what I can remember. The whole experience was very odd, and it still gives me chills whenever I think about it. I've always been one to go out exploring abandoned buildings, or areas that are haunted. I've always been a skeptic, even though most of my friends have had what they believe to be a paranormal experience, simply because I've never experienced anything myself. So me and my friend Trevor were going out to whatever was apparently the most haunted road in Western New York. Although both of us have been to the road before, just not with each other. Trevor said he'd heard some crazy stuff on the road where he went, but I on the other hand had not. Trevor's had plenty of whack ghost happenings all through his life, and he believes there's a spirit attached to him, or something along those lines. But let me tell you about this road. I don't know too much about it. This is just what my friends have told me and what I've read online. It's very old and long. No street lights, 
tons of trees following the road, and some creepy hidden paths in the woods. Apparently, people have seen a little girl, some horse dog type thing, and an old man walking around with a lantern. There's also supposedly an old church somewhere in the woods that was burnt down. Anyway, we were driving up and down the road to make sure there were no serial killers or monsters. I was paranoid, okay? I might not be a big believer, but I get the creeps too. When this car all of a sudden drives by us. Thing is, just before we passed them, a black figure darts behind their car and just vanishes into the darkness. I couldn't believe my eyes. I hit the brakes as an immediate reaction, thinking I was about to hit a deer or something. But again, there was nothing to hit. It literally disappeared in front of us. Trevor saw it, I saw it, and the car next to us slammed on their brakes too and screamed, what the hell was that? So I'm sure as hell that they're assuming they saw something in their mirrors. I tried rationalizing, and we continued driving down the road and decided to park and turn off the car and lights. We were trying to get an EVP, so we needed silence and didn't want to kill my car battery, so we brought our flashlights. Nothing came up, so we just started walking down the road, listening and looking around for any sign of paranormal activity. We get to about 10 feet away from my car, when my freaking car doors just locked. Clear as day, you could hear it click. All four doors. Of course, Trevor heard it too, and we ran back to the car, and sure enough, every door was locked. I didn't touch my car keys. They were wrapped around my neck with a lanyard. Nothing was near my neck, and nothing bumped the buttons or anything. We both hopped in and skirted off. Finally, as we get towards the middle of the road, we calm down and pull over again, just so that I didn't have a panic attack, because what? We're sitting there in my car. I'm looking down the road and he's looking next to us, flashing his light, being all sketched out. I guess his flashlight kept flickering on and off but that can easily be explained by old batteries, probably. I kid you not. I saw what looked like a lantern. Maybe I was just being paranoid, but I saw something. Just as the light goes off into the woods, I turn to Trevor to see if he saw it too. And just before anything comes out of his mouth, we both hear what sounded like someone walking in the woods right next to us. I turned my car back on, and off we went, away from that damn road. Once I grow some more balls, we're bringing more people, and we're going back to Delaware Road. We might even go down the trails and look for the church, or what's left of it. This happened when I was around eight years old. When I was young, I always wanted to do whatever my sister was doing. Therefore, when her friends at the time brought over her new Ouija board, of course I was playing it with them. I can remember this night so vividly. My sister, her friend and I were in our family room sitting on the floor, while our mum sat at the kitchen table playing a game on the computer, but was still playing with us. A little backstory, my parents were both Christian but didn't think a board game purchased from Toys R Us could be harmful. My mum and dad just had our house built a few years before, and we were the first to live here. However, there is nothing but woods in our backyard, which made it feel pretty creepy to play in front of a window that faced the woods. Anyhow, we played with this board for about an hour, asking it simple questions and getting simple responses. That is when my sister's friend asked if the spirit would give us a sign. The board said no. She then asked again if the spirit would give us a sign. And 10 seconds later, 
We all heard it. This evil growl came from thin air. It sounded like something was sitting in front of us. I still remember it to this day, because it was so loud and clear. It was not an animal sound, and most definitely didn't come from the woods. I remember that sinister feeling that immediately filled the air, and we all started freaking the hell out and running around the house. I begged my mum to call a priest, and I can remember the look on my mum's face like she knew it was real, but didn't want to scare us any further. She couldn't explain it. We were terrified. My sister and I shared a room, and we were all so scared to sleep at night that my dad would sleep on the floor so that we could rest. We weren't to leave each other alone. We even stayed in the bathroom while each other showered because that experience haunted us. Now that I'm 23 years old and a psychology major, I have become somewhat skeptical towards paranormal activity. But when I think back to that piercing growl, I cannot find any other plausible explanation for what we heard. My mum passed about five years ago, and I wish I could ask her about it now, but I'm certain she would vouch for it. My sister and I also talk about it from time to time, but always get such an eerie feeling when explaining it. I'd like to know if anyone else has experienced anything similar. I have a cabin in the north woods of Minnesota, located about 15 miles inland from Grand Maris, so basically Canada and about as old of a forest that you can be in. I've been going to this cabin for 22 years. We built it from the ground up with our hands. The front half of our property is without a doubt my family's. However, we have a back lot that is about 10 acres and backs up to the Superior National Forest. I have not done a lot of exploring back there. We mostly use it to preserve the land and to pile trees that fall into the road. I decided to check it out with my wife and dog. I don't know if this next bit is relating to what happened, but it is the first time I have really explored our back lot and really the only thing that stands out. We started on the road right at the top of my driveway and I get our bearings. We walk without incident for about two hours. Considering we were bushwalking with a machete, it was pretty gruelling work, as anyone who has trailblazed can tell you. We stopped in an area that had what I like to call fairy mounds. Not because I believe in fairies, but because it is a pile of dirt or rotted plants that have been completely covered in moss and look super smooth and kind of out of place. They are super bright green, and there are quite a few of them deep in the forest. After the two hours of walking, our dog yelps and starts biting at the air around her. We figured she got into a beehive in the ground, so we decided that it was a good time to turn around. I did not see any bees, but my wife did say she saw a couple. As the day progressed, I kept hearing footsteps in our main lot in the same set of trees on the southwest corner by our well. We have many animals including bears, lynx, wolves and deer, so I dismiss it as nothing, but the hair stands up on end, and I listen to my basic prey instincts and figure it's some sort of predator. Fast forward to that night. I still cannot shake that feeling of being watched by a predator. It's now pitch black out, and our dog keeps trying to go outside. But every time she does, she acts weird and doesn't leave the light circle cast by our floodlights. She keeps begging to be let out. I've seen this before, and it happened to my old dog, when a pack of wolves were on our land trying to lure the dog out to be ganged up. So I lock up the dog door and grab my gun, I cannot reiterate enough just how unsettled I feel. 
I've been on this land for almost three decades. I've slept under the stars, hunted in the trees, and hiked out with a flashlight for miles, because I know the paths so well. This night, however, the forest felt like a stranger. For the first time in my life, I did not feel welcome on my own land. It felt menacing. So I decide to go to bed and just sleep it off as it's very late. My wife was watching a movie and had a soda after 5 p.m. So like any 30 year old, she can't sleep yet. Incoming sleep paralysis. I'm laying in bed on my side, my arm under my ear, and I can feel my body start to get heavy. But I can hear my heartbeat in my arm like a drumbeat. All of a sudden I realise I can't move at all, and my heart speeds up. I try to wiggle my fingers, and can only get them to wiggle very slightly. And I know for a fact at that moment, I was in sleep paralysis. So I know what this comes with. Paralysis, intruders, waking dreams. Holy shit. I still think about it. I see my dog walk into my room. At least I think it's my dog. I can only see the shadow close to the ground, and I can't turn my head. So I try to call her name. Coo! I can't make my mouth work. I try to call her on my bed. Maybe the jostling will wake me up. So, I lamely pat my bed with my limp hand. Also a no-go. My heart still beating in my head louder and louder, but it's comforting for some reason. I see my wife walk into the room. She sits on the bed, and I beg her to please wake me up. It comes out so soft I can barely hear myself. I ask for water, but she doesn't move. I try shouting to wake me up, but it comes out no louder than a murmur. As I look at her, I realise... I did not feel her actually sit on the bed. I look at her face and realise it's just a shadow. And why hasn't she moved since she got into the room? She is not my wife. Okay, that's weird. Never heard of an intruder being a person before. So I look away, my eyes glancing around the room. I'm frantically wiggling my toes and fingers, trying anything to get my goddamn body to do just one thing I tell it to do. Nothing. My heart sounds like one solid beat now. I look up and see black. In the middle of the room, there is an absolute black circle, a spot in the room devoid of anything. I feel like I'm being pulled into the spot as it keeps getting bigger and bigger. Then all at once, with my heart thundering in my ears, it's over. I regain control of my body. I look around disoriented, and I look down. No dog. I walk out to the living area, and my wife is there. I ask her if the dog came into the room, and she says no. Apparently, I was in bed for an hour. I check the clock, and it's 3.07. My dog is sleeping on the couch. The feeling is gone. I talk to my wife about it, and she thinks it was just a nightmare created by me freaking myself out. I tell her I think we ran into a wood spirit of some kind, or just a really freaky demon. I still don't know. I have had unexplained things happen to me before, but this one felt so close. I have no description other than that. I live in Hobart, Tasmania, which is a city surrounded by forest, which Australians call the bush. It doesn't take long if you walk in any direction to find yourself in the bush. One afternoon in 1987, I decided to go for a walk on a nearby reserve, known as Knock Lofty, which comprises of a series of hills behind North Hobart. As I walked along, I looked up and saw a man standing right in the middle of the walking track. He had long hair and a beard and seemed a bit grubby. I could tell that there was something weird about him from the fact that he stood in the middle of the track and waited as I walked towards him. 
He started staring straight into my eyes, otherwise doing nothing. His presence worried me, so as I passed I looked away from him, because he had not taken his eyes off me, and I was fairly scared, there being no one else on the track that day that I'd seen as I had walked by, and, foolishly, I'd not left a note at home for my friends stating that I was out in the bush. So, if this guy had been a killer or something, he would have had no problems getting away with it and making me disappear without a trace. As I passed right by him, I felt a palpable madness growing in him, and I kept my head down, worrying that he was now following me. Then I waited until I was sure he was a fair way behind me, before turning back and see if he was indeed following me. Instead, what I saw amazed me so much I stopped dead in my tracks, and watched him for a little while. He smiled straight at me, and I think I must have unknowingly grinned a little back at him in amazement. What he was now doing was still standing in the exact same place where I just walked past him, except he was now beaming with an insanely proud smile, and staring into my eyes with wild exhilaration, at what he'd somehow managed to do because all over his outstretched arms, shoulders and head, were hopping dozens and dozens of tiny unwild native birds, seemingly attracted to this person, as though by some weird magnetic force, something that I cannot explain to this day, and which I have only seen as something fitting into the realms of the paranormal, for its inexplicably strange nature. I could not believe what I was seeing, and afterwards what I had seen, but I also did not feel safe to approach him, so I turned around and went home, impressed by what I'd witnessed and very excited about sharing this story with friends. Unfortunately, the first person to get home completely refused to believe my story, so I gave up bothering trying to tell anyone else about it that day. However, 10 years later or so I mentioned it to him, and he exclaimed, oh yeah, I know some other people who saw him, and they say it happened to them as well, which really vindicated me. I don't know whether or not it was actually my story that I told him years ago that he recalled, as he smoked a lot of the green, but I felt good to know that I'd finally managed to at least get one friend to believe the strange bird man of Knocklofty Terrace. I haven't been up there for years, and sometimes wonder if he still hangs around up there waiting to freak out unsuspecting passers-by, or if he just manifests out of the ether as some type of master magician to call his bird friends. But one thing I am certain of is that on that day, there really was nothing you could call normal about the encounter at all. I've had a few personal paranormal experiences in my life, but this one stands out in my mind. To preface, I am a 22 year old male, currently in my last semester of college. This story takes place during my freshman year at the same college. I go to a smaller university in Connecticut. It is located pretty much right at the base of a popular state park with a large mountain. If you're familiar with Connecticut, I'm sure you can guess which university I'm talking about. There is a lot of Native American folklore associated with the mountain, as Native American tribes used to live up in the surrounding area, and some weird stuff has definitely happened there. A kid even fell to his death while hiking not too long ago, but I highly doubt that that was due to anything paranormal. Behind my freshman dorm building, there was a steep hill that led into the woods. This was where everyone in our building would go to smoke. Halfway up the hill, there was a little cleared out space with a concrete wall that you could sit on, and then a much larger area at the top of the hill, with trails and a big concrete wall. It was a nightly occasion for me and my roommates to head up to those woods and smoke a little of the green. Usually, there would be other people smoking too, 
so we were completely fine with going there at any time. One night, my roommate and I headed to the hill just like we did every night. Our other roommate stayed behind because he had to study or do homework or something. I don't fully remember. We climbed the hill and went to the smaller clearing, halfway up, rather than the larger area. There was no one else up there, and it was a little later than we normally went up, as it was right around midnight. But like I said, we felt safe enough to go up there at any time. We smoked a few bowls and just hung out for a while. Keep in mind, both of us smoked pretty regularly, so two bowls wasn't doing much for us, and I'm definitely not the type to get paranoid when I'm stoned, so our sobriety, or lack thereof, was not an excuse for what happened. It was pretty windy that night, so all of the trees around us were loudly swaying. Out of nowhere, the wind completely stopped, and the trees fell still. Then the leaves on the trees that we were standing by very slowly and eerily fell to the ground, all at the same level and speed. We looked at each other and kind of nervously laughed. Suddenly, we were both filled with this massive sense of impending doom, like something was telling us to leave the woods immediately. I know this because my roommate told me he felt the same way after the fact. We grabbed our weed and full-fledged sprinted out of the woods and down the steep hill. As I was running down the hill, I fell backwards really hard and messed up my elbow. To be honest, it almost felt like I was yanked back by something, but there's a definite possibility that I just slipped on the dirt because we were flying down this essentially vertical hill. I picked myself up and we ran into our dorm building, slamming the door behind us. After that, my roommate refused to go into the woods to smoke for the rest of the year. There were a few times where I went back up the hill and into those woods by myself to smoke, as I didn't feel like walking across campus to go to another spot. For the most part, I was fine and didn't experience anything. But there were a few other times where I would be up there around midnight and would suddenly be filled with that same impending doom telling me to leave those woods. I haven't gone back to the area since, but I can still see the eerie way those leaves fell around us. So this happened when me and my family were on vacation in Pigeon Forge. I was in high school at the time, and we stayed in a two-story, two-bedroom cabin in the mountainous wooded area. On the trip we made, my parents, my sister, and my grandfather, who has recently been diagnosed with dementia. The upstairs part of the cabin contained a bedroom and a kitchen slash living room, with narrow stairs leading down to a room with a pool table and a couch, and then to the master bedroom. My parents slept in the master bedroom, of course. I slept on the couch in the room with the pool table. My sister slept upstairs on a couch, and my grandfather slept on the other bedroom upstairs. Well, second night there, things start happening. I'm laying on the couch and everyone else is asleep. I'm playing my Game Boy, which has the volume turned all the way down, when I start hearing mumbling coming from across the room. My parents' door is open, so I just brush it off as sound bouncing off the wall and not mention it to anyone. The next night, I again hear the mumbling, so I walk into my parents' bedroom, and both are just watching TV. I ask what they're talking about, to which they reply they weren't, and they were watching Family Guy when it happened, so it wasn't like I was hearing the TV. So I go back in, sit down, and I hear a pool ball roll across the table. I'm pretty scared, but you know, I'm a man. So I do nothing and eventually fall asleep. Next night, the same thing happens, only a lot more frequently. During the last night there, I'm getting used to hearing noises and pool balls rolling. All of a sudden, I hear one of the pool sticks slam into the ground, 
when it was currently laying flat on the center of the table. Then I see this shadow pass in front of the opening in front of my mum and dad's bedroom. Then I feel this ice cold tingly feeling, sensation kind of thing on my ankle. It felt like someone was grabbing my ankle and I noped right off that couch and into my parents' bedroom. My mum immediately says, you saw the shadow too then? And I was like, yeah, and I've been hearing all this other stuff. My sister then runs down the stairs because she gets awoken by the commotion. I tell dad to turn off the TV and we all hear mumbling and pool balls rolling. Mum makes dad go upstairs to check if it's grandpa talking. While he's gone, we continue to hear the mumbling. Dad gets back and says that he was sound asleep. So a few years later, I decided that I wanted to go back to check it out. I tried to book the cabin, but it no longer appears on the website. I think it's been torn down or remodeled, but I know that it once existed. Picture this, a person, just a regular person, in regular everyday clothes, but semi-blurry. All clothing is completely solid, the same colour blue from top to bottom. The flesh is almost a pinkish colour, with literally zero facial features. The first time I can recall seeing them was when living in an extremely haunted house in eastern Connecticut. It was extremely tainted land. There was a small pond my cousins and I would go fish at. It was actually two ponds right next to each other, one slightly lower than the other. On this particular day, my cousin was between the two ponds, and I was on the opposite side of the lower one. But you could still see everything at the upper pond. I started noticing two figures come from the other side of the pond he was at, walking across the water, side by side, like it wasn't even there. I was stunned for a solid minute until I started flagging him down to turn around. I don't know why I couldn't yell, but I just kept waving at him to spin around, but he was looking at me like I was crazy. It was like out of a bad movie. I threw my pole down and started running around the water to get to him as fast as I could. I think when these things realized I saw them, they booked it the other way, back from whence they came. I could see them go into the woods on the other side from where they came from. He, obviously, didn't believe me. I would say, okay, I'm just crazy. But I remember another time fishing there by myself. I found some dead puppies floating in the water in a plastic bag, which isn't really supernatural in a way, but I also began hearing Indian drums playing in the woods, like real Native American drumming, and it was getting closer to me. I dropped my gear and ran like hell, and didn't go back for two days. I was probably 10 or 11. The second time I remember seeing one, was in Bridgeport, Connecticut of all places. There was another small pond, literally just above paddle rating, in a really small area of the woods where we built a fort. I cut through the woods with friends and we crossed Park Avenue to where St. Margaret's Shrine is. I turned around for some reason and saw another figure, all blue clothing, no features, but oddly jet black with crazy looking hair, just kind of lumbering in the area we were in. I watched it and asked my buddies to look, but they didn't see anything. The last time I remember seeing one was up in Oxford with my cousins in the woods. It was known for some people doing worship there. It was me, some cousins and the dog. We split up and I was at a river in the woods. Something made me decide I wanted to climb the rock up the very steep hillside, like a cliff with the river below it. When you're 12, this thing looks huge. 
When I made it to the top, their dog was there and they were gone. I got this weird feeling like I was being watched, and the dog started getting jittery and barking when I turned around, and then there was another one. It turned and took off again. I guess they don't like being noticed. I would have said again, I'm crazy and seeing things, but the dog took off after it. I ran after the dog until she came back, and we both left the woods. Anyone who knows Oxford knows it can have some deep woods, so this was a trek back, but the dog wasn't agitated anymore, so I figured whatever it was, was gone. I sort of figured they weren't aggressive either, since the dog wasn't worried anymore, but I swear, the first time with my cousin fishing at the ponds, they were creeping up behind him to do something nefarious. But maybe I was wrong and they were just curious. It sounds unbelievable. Even I have never truly come across any conclusion, nor 100% believe my own eyes nor memory. But they have never had any kind of explanation. Nor have I ever seen them again. And I've tried. My husband, myself, and our two kids were stationed in the UK for four years. We found a beautiful old cottage that had been renovated to accommodate two families, sort of like a duplex. We were told by the owners that it dated back to the 1500s and was the caretaker's home for a priory that was behind the property, but is now just ruins. The front of the cottage had an open pedestrian trail right in front of it. It was secluded, but we had a lot of dog walkers and families that used the path to get to the river in the woods. Just a beautiful and charming place to live in general. We would often chat with people using the path, and little bits of information about the house came to light. We were told that a witch used to live there, and had a lot of strange going-ons. Weird noises, lights in the woods, and we were also told the little bridge behind our house was haunted, so we were intrigued but laughed it off. My oldest daughter had a huge bedroom, and so she set it up like an apartment. Being a teen, she spent a lot of time in her room with her friends. She would tell me about noises at night, since we shared a wall with our neighbour, I told her it was probably them. She brushed it off, but a while later she told me she would awake to breathing in her ear. She also said it felt like someone would sit down on the bed in the middle of the night, and at one point she woke up to a dark figure standing in the front window. She's on the second floor. She eventually got used to it, and joked about it when she had visitors staying with us. Her room was used when we had company, because it was the biggest room with the queen bed. We have had several women in our family that noticed the same thing, and wouldn't sleep there anymore. Only women, it never seemed malicious, just shocking. 